Mine coming through? Yeah. Good morning. Okay. Good morning. I I don't think Pete's gonna, I don't see reason why you can't just put your name down there. I don't think Pete's gonna be here today. And just put it face down. Flip it down. There, perfect. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to call to order the regular board meeting of March 1st, 2021 at 9.30 in a small hall. Please turn off your phones and stand for the invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. Oh. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this lovely first day of March. We are again asking for your guidance. Divine direction in the state of the for our children's sake. We ask for the nine days. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are you ready? Okay, Denise Beauchamp. Here. Mary Chandler. Lori Dalton, here. Gordon Elton. Here. Russell McAllister. Here. Pete Price. Here. Sandy Simonich. 
Here. Mike Sansoni. Here. Dwayne Trotter. Here. Uh, with that, we have a special order of business. We have Sandy Tudor and her uh, fellow co-workers from Manatee County on building and development. And they're going to talk to us about the flood ordinance changes that are coming that could affect us. Okay. I am Sandy Tudor. I'm the, the floodplain management, floodplain section manager for the building development services. I'm here today to talk to you about our new proposed ordinance because it is going to impact this park in some areas. Uh, first off, I did bring a map, the new flood zones for you, you know, for you to have. And I also brought some copies of the draft ordinance. I didn't bring a lot, but I did bring some for whoever needs to look it over. Draft ordinances for you. First off, I want to discuss the maps. In some areas of the trailer states, you're, you're going from one zone to another zone, and the elevations on the maps in some areas are going down which is a good thing. Um, I, I can't tell you off most of the areas. Are, <laughs> there are there are also going to be some that actually come out of the 100 year flood uh, If you want information on that, you're more than welcome to call us. We'll look up your lot and tell you what it's going to be. I will leave my business card. Sir. So you can you can just give us a call if you if you have a question on your exact zone. To give you a little history, um, FEMA for stick built buildings or block whatever we call them stick built, they have always required you to meet the elevation on the map. Manatee County's ordinance from 1987 has required a one foot free board. For exist in 1986, FEMA allowed for an exception for manufactured home parks that were existing. Prior to our original ordinance, which was in November of 1974, you were if you couldn't meet base flood with, with the standard setup, you were allowed to do 36 inch reinforced piers. That exception is going away. They will no longer be allowed to do the 36 inch reinforced piers. You will now be required to elevate that trailer to the bottom of the I beam, whatever elevation is on the map, plus one. So, if you, for example, if the grade of your lot is four feet and base flood elevation where you're putting it is, is eight, you will, you will need to technically put it almost five feet above grade. We are being required to do this because of the change in the community rating system, which is a voluntary program whereby we earn discounts to flood insurance premiums for people in the floodplain. Currently, we are class five which allots a 25% discount to those that are in the high risk flood zone. It allows 10% in the, in the low risk zones, which are the exits. If we do not remove this exception, based on the new prerequisites to go to a class nine and the higher the number, the lower the discount. If we do not remove this exception, we will be pushed back to a class nine, which would drop the discounts to 5%. So unfortunately, it's going to impact some people putting in new trailers. So we have to do that or we're going to lose our discount. Um, it's basically what I wanted to tell you. I wanted to let you know that this is coming. Currently, the ordinance is still being reviewed by the county attorney. I'm hoping to get it adopted by June. By when? June. Thank you. Um, because in order to maintain the credit we now have, I have to have it adopted prior to the insurance services office representative doing an audit on our floodplain management program. It has to be in place before I meet with them. Otherwise, we will revert back to a class nine and drop to a 5% discount. And I wanted this opportunity to let you know that we're coming so you weren't totally caught off guard. <coughs> Again, we are being required to do this. So if the floodplain goes to nine feet, say to Wisconsin or Iowa, 
you would have to build your home. One foot above that to the one. bottom of the ivy. So you're gonna start seeing wow. trailers a lot higher than you do now currently mm -hmm. see. Yes. If uh, permits have been uh, uh, issued by the county to install a new mobile home, and then this ordinance goes into effect after that permit is uh, issued, but before the home has been installed, will the new change? Anything that met? any permit applications that come in after this ordinance is adopted will have to build to the higher level. Right, but the ones that come before but haven't been. We're built. not going to retroactive. Okay, thank you. You talk about a discount. Is that for individuals, businesses? Yeah, or both? it's it's for any for individual or businesses flood insurance premiums. Anybody else have any questions? And FEMA has changed the floodplains for insurance. Yes, it, I gave you a copy of the new map. Again, like some of, said, some of the base floods have gone down. Some of the zones have changed. Your, like I said, some of your V zone has, has, has gotten narrower, which is, um, is, which is considered anything that's, it has a three foot cresting waiver above on, on surge is considered a velocity zone. <clears throat> After that, you go to what is known as the AE zone. And that just means it's a, it's not a, it's not the velocity zone. Construction criteria is a little bit different, but you still need to meet all the elevation requirements, the same as you would in the zone, all elevation required. Does the art committee have any questions back there? Dennis, Dennis, I'll give you my copy of this. And I'll give you the flood map later. Any other questions? Mike, you'll get all that to TJ for public yes. record. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you, you for having me. I didn't know she was going to talk. I got cards too. Okay. Oh, sure. This really does affect us as an art committee as much as simple information. If somebody says, What can I do? We can kind of guide them in that yeah. way. Because yeah. we have no real yeah. 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 Emma Jean Nelson, 1614 Michigan Avenue. Good morning. Well, here I am back again in front of the board and residents, and guess what? So is the boat at 1611 Michigan Avenue and obviously still in violation of our deed restrictions. According to the public records of Manatee County, Black Book 8, page 138, paragraph number six, it is a direct violation of our deed restrictions to park a boat or a trailer that is not completely under the carport of an owner's residence. Well, this particular boat at 1611 Michigan Avenue has been parked in front of the residence from property line to property line on and off since November of 2020. The first time I came in front of the board, it had been parked there for 37 days, totally ignoring our deed restrictions. The day after I brought it to the attention of the board, it was moved from the front of the residence, right down the street and right into the park storage area. Very obviously ahead of a waiting list of 20 plus residents waiting for storage space. Now, how did that happen? And most importantly, how was it allowed to happen? After being told to remove the boat from that area, again, guess what? It came right back to the front of 1611 Michigan Avenue again the owner still ignoring our deed restrictions. So now it's been there for another 26 days since February 4th. Since this owner continues to blatantly ignore the deed restrictions, may I please suggest we set a precedent here and now and have her boat towed away at her expense so she can feel the frustration we all have had to deal with since November of 2020. I understand the board has no recourse to enforce our deed restrictions other than sending letters that are obviously ignored. I'll assume again, the attorney will take over and again, the residents will pay <clears throat> more attorney fees. 
These fees will just be added to the already fees we've been paying for two years for the same owner who installed an improper awning on her property that literally hangs over onto the neighbor's property. The case has not been settled yet after two years. So I'll repeat what I said the first time I brought this full issue to the board. How many times do we as residents have to pay attorney fees for this one address in our park? And since I have a few more seconds left, don't let a fool or trick us about taking off the tires so it can't be towed. The boat sat there two weeks before she took off those tires. Could she have moved it then? Who knows? Thank you very much. Any other comments? Resident comments. Hi, Pierre Ignazi Schaefer, 2207 Illinois Avenue. I want to thank the board members for their service again. As we know, some people that are on the board are dealing with some personal issues. That's one of the reasons I'm here. It's just in support of the fire company. Um, just to reiterate, there will be a town hall meeting, which will be March 6th. That will start at six o'clock. Prior to that meeting, there will be an open house, March 6th from two to five. There will be controlled social distancing at all of these events. And for that open house, as I understand it, the mechanical door that's located towards the parking lot here is where we will monitor where they will allow uh, 50 participants at one time. According to the Tribune, um, today you should be able to go up and um, request a Zoom if you do not want to make the physical meeting at the town hall. Um, however, due to a few technical difficulties, we hope to have that up today or tomorrow. We will also be having a sign up at the post office Tuesday, which is March 2nd, as well as Wednesday, March 3rd, where we do 10 to noon and 1 to 3. We will have volunteers there with a brochure and a sign up information. So, in the event you don't have the opportunity to go out and check the link, we will hopefully give us your email and we will email you the link if you prefer to Zoom. Um, I believe that's it. And Lori can maybe comment on this afterwards. She has, she has information as well. Thank you again for your service. Thank you. Any other residents or comments? Dottie, do you have any comments? Yes, I do. Dottie Deerwester, 1804 Ohio Avenue. Uh, two comments. I'm requesting to have added to a future ag uh, workshop agenda the uh, issue about the Tribune and the contract and what we can and can't put in there as residents or businesses at Trailer Estates. And also the second item is about the hotspots. They're not working. Uh, they're not available. And I think we're paying for it through our spectrum um, account and the computer club keeps promoting residents to be able to access it, but they're not there. So I'd like to have a workshop about the issue of the hotspots as well. Thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none, public comments are closed. Um, responses. What are we going to do about 1611 Michigan? Um, I'll ask Gordon. Okay. Um, as was stated, the boat is back at 1611. On a, a letter was sent to the owner to correct, asking to correct the violation. On February 22nd, I received a text message and I'll read it verbatim. Hi, Gordon, Joyce here. Just wanted to give you a heads up on the boat. The mechanic brought it back from this shop. When arrived, we noticed fluid coming from two wheels. Just had a company come look at it Friday and another one today. All four need wheel bearings, so it's dangerous if moved. One company is two weeks out and the other is almost the same. So put a down payment on the job. 
after she's going into water so we can raise the risers on the trailer. Thanks, Joyce. The question of what we can do. I request the board's approval to send this on to the attorney for follow-up. There's, to my knowledge, there's nothing else we can do. The recommendation that we consider having a towed, I don't believe we have any authority to remove uh, any vehicles from private property. So I, I think our only uh, course of action is to ask the attorney to follow up on it. Can, can we check with the attorney on that one? Because I already checked with the attorney. Oh. We can have what we should do for the attorney is send her a certified letter, give her 15 days, and then if she doesn't, uh, to pursue it in court with part with the court case that we already currently have going with her. So there'll be two violations of the deed restriction. Uh, we don't have to go back and start from ground zero on this. And I think that's the appropriate way of going with this. Otherwise, she's going to continue the resident at that address is going to continue to play a game with us. I I understand that she has a problem with leaky things. That's her problem, not our problem. Okay, the boat needs to be removed. She needs to put the tires back on, move it to some place where the work can be done. Uh, you know, the residents have been somewhat understanding, but it's gotten to the point where it's beyond understanding um, as it relates to that particular issue. Is there any objections to doing that? So you Not can go here. ahead and tell the attorney to go ahead, send a certified letter, and if she doesn't respond, to go ahead and pursue it in court. Okay, so the, uh, I'll ask the attorney to send the certified letter. Yes, yes. correct. Okay. And and take um, pictures of it, send him pictures, send him or her pictures of the boat as it stands currently. She also had a car, I don't know where she moved her car, but she did have a car parked in front of a place. I think the sheriff's department took care of that problem. So I, I have some secondhand information on that. Well, the uh, I was told by someone else that they had talked with the deputy and the deputy did not have a problem with the car being parked in the street. Did, did say it had to be parked in the direction of traffic flow, but did not uh, issue a citation or issue a warning from that person's understanding about parking it in the street. All I know is the car hasn't been there. So. It, so, it, if it shows up again, Gordon, you might ask the SO to talk to the fire chief. It's not my job to uh, enforce rules in the street. Okay. It sounds like it's a fire di district or emergency services issue. Well, I, I, I would beg to differ. It is your responsibility to make sure that she's in compliance with the deed restriction, which require a car to be parked on her property and on her lot for an extended period of time. She parked it on the street overnight. She's not in compliance with the deed restriction as it relates to the car. That's why we have carports. That's why we have driveways. I don't see that deed restriction about parking cars under the carport or on the lot saying that uh, we have control over what's parked in the street. Moving on um, with that, and thank you for the information on the fire department. Appreciate that. Um, if somebody wishes to add something to the workshop, we can, uh, as it relates to the request by Dottie. Um, moving on, do I have a motion? Yeah. Oh, one, thing on, one thing on the hot spots, uh, mm -hmm. let me get back in touch with Spectrum or I'll get in touch with uh, Big fish and see just what's going on with that. I don't think we need a workshop on it, but okay. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the board of trustee meeting minutes for February 15th, 2021? So moved. Denise, second by uh, Russ. Discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And so on a half a step. I'm sorry. Sorry. 
Okay, thank uh, you. I need a motion to approve the Board of Trustees workshop minutes from February 15th, 2021. So Denise will move. I need a second. Russ, discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, Mary couldn't be with us today because of uh, some family issues. Um, in the checking account, we have $46,361.49. In the investment account, we have $1,431,738.50. We have published in the Bradington Herald the notice for a public hearing to be held on Monday, March 15th at 9.30 in the small hall for public comment on the Board of Trustees budget for 2021-2022. Um, with that, I am going to introduce uh, Daniel Anderson. Mike, I think we need a a motion and a second uh, on the treasurer's report. The treasurer's report isn't it, done yet. This is part of this it. Okay. Part of the treasurer's okay, gotcha. report. Um, ask the auditor, Daniel Anderson from Malden and Jenkins, CP and advisory to give the audit report. Good morning. Ah, that works. Good. Starting out pretty good, huh? Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I wanted to thank everyone for allowing me to come here uh, and present the results of the audit to you. Just make sure this is popping up all right. Can we, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Daniel Anderson, and I'm an audit director with Malden and Jenkins, and I have responsibility for the district's 2020 audit. I'll kind of awkwardly stand in front of you here just because my mouse is going to allow me to click through the presentation, and then I can move back behind the podium uh, and answer any questions that you may have at the end of the presentation. A, a quick overview of our brief agenda that we're going to have. I'll give you a little bit of information about Malden and Jenkins. I'll talk about the audit opinion that we've issued, talk about some of the required communications that we have under governmental auditing standards, and then we'll go through, go through some financial information. And then at the end, I'll have any questions. And certainly, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, you know, don't hesitate to raise your hand and stop me. Uh, I don't mind that at all either. Quickly about Malden and Jenkins, we are a large regional audit organization with an office here in Bradenton, Florida. Our governmental practice has been serving governments for over 100 years now. Uh, and in total, we serve approximately 500 governments, and that includes about 120 special districts similar to trailer estates here. Our firm is considered to be one of the top 20 firms uh, for conducting single audits in governmental auditing in the United States. We do offer 16 hours of continuing education to our clients free on an annual basis, uh, and that's not just for, for Mary. Uh, but that extends to anyone here on the board. So if you wish to attend one of our uh, wonderful presentations about governmental accounting, certainly reach out to me and I can provide you with the information for the next one. And then lastly, one thing that we are proud of is one of our governmental partners was actually recently appointed as the chair of the Governmental Accounting Standards Board. Uh, so it's certainly something that's humbling to us. And, you know, we're really proud of the fact that the standard setting body for governmental accounting chose someone from our firm to lead their entity for the next seven years. A little too far away. Talking about the district's 2020 audit, uh, we have rendered an unmodified audit opinion, which is the highest form of assurance that we can provide. So the audited financial statements that you have, in our opinion, are considered to fairly present the financial information of the district and the results of operations for the September 30, 2020 fiscal year end. In addition, you'll note two additional reports in the back of the financial statement document. One we refer to as the Yellow Book Report, which is a report on the district's internal controls and compliance with laws and regulations. And this is required under governmental auditing. 
Uh, there's no opinion that we issue with this report. It's basically if we find something that we feel is an issue, we'll document it here. Uh, so it's kind of, we call it negative assurance. There's no information that we pr provided here that we feel needs to be brought to your attention uh, because we had no issues in our testing of the district's compliance with laws and regulations. Next, there's a management letter also in the back of the financial statements. And this is required by the Auditor General for the state of Florida. And this kind of covers certain procedures that they require us to perform. And again, it's a form of negative assurance. You know, if there is something identified here, we'll bring it to your attention. But again, no issues noted uh, during that test. And I'll kind of refer back to this in just a few minutes. Um, because aside from the financial statement document, you should have received our auditor's discussion and analysis. Uh, and this goes through all of the required communications that we have. Uh, essentially, you know, we were able to perform the audit with no issues. We had no disagreements with management in conducting the audit. They provided us all the information that we were able uh, or that we asked for in a timely manner. Uh, so certainly working with TJ and Mary uh, was very beneficial for us in order to get the audit done in a timely manner. So we appreciate that relationship. Uh, one thing that you'll note in the auditor's discussion and analysis is a comment that we provided concerning the financial condition of the district. You know, going back to the management letter, the Auditor General's Office does require us to perform financial condition assessment of the district. And if we note uh, any significant issues, we do have to report that in the management letter. Uh, and performing those procedures based on the, the procedures that the Auditor General outlined to us, uh, you know, they put out about 25 or so financial indicators for all governments in the state of Florida uh, that we have to evaluate. Now, the district, it, all 25 of those aren't applicable to the district because, you know, they don't have proprietary funds. You know, you're not a municipality where you're, you're taxing, you're actually just levying assessments. Um, so about half of those, a little less than half of them, or a little more than half of them are not applicable. Uh, but when we perform those procedures, a lot of the ratios that we we analyzed, and I'll go through them here in just a minute, came back as what they, the Auditor General's Office considers to be unfavorable. Uh, now, one thing that the, the Auditor General rules tell us to do is they say, okay, evaluate these conditions, and then say, what do we know about the district that we can do to say, uh, all right, even though it says unfavorable here, you know, the district does have these other things in place that we can say, in total, it, it's not an unfavorable financial condition. So. We went through that process and I'll go through those charts here in just a minute. Uh, but I did kind of want to point out, you know, while we put that comment in there, it's mainly just a matter of providing information to you to say, here are some trends and analysis that the Auditor General's office uh, is asking us to look at. Let's show you to be, you know, let's show these to you to where whenever you're going through the financial information, you're looking at it as well. Uh, so I'll go through the financial results and then again, answer any questions that you may have. This chart here, shows operating revenues versus expenses for the last three years so that you can see, you know, the operating revenues and expenses have been pretty comparable for the last three years, uh, which is very good for the district. I think that's kind of what, what you're looking for uh, to where you're not bringing in too much, but you're not overspending as well compared to the, the revenues that you brought in. Uh, this just shows operating revenues by type for 2020 versus 2019. Uh, so you see the charges for services were actually up a little bit in fiscal year 2020 than 19. Uh, and then the assessment revenue was down a little bit uh, from fiscal 2019. And I think the big factor in the assessments being a little bit down is probably more people taking advantage of the early payment discount uh, if you pay your, your assessment bill through the property tax collector's office early. So uh, I know the rate was the same between the two years. So that's likely what that cause is. This chart shows the, the major functions of your expenses for the two fiscal years. Again, you could see pretty consistent, uh, aside from the cable TV there, which was a little bit higher in 2020 versus 2019, pretty consistent throughout the two fiscal years. And then this chart here shows, you know, the ending fund balance of the district's general fund for the past five fiscal years. So obviously from 2016 to 2017, there was a dip. And then from 2017 through 2020, it's been pretty consistent uh, over the past four years. And I'm about to get into the charts from the Auditor General's office. And I think a big reason a lot of these are showing up as unfavorable is they compare where you're at now versus five years ago from now. So you've got that big dip that you have from 2016 that, that's really taking into account this year. Um, so that's why, you know, again, as part of our assessment, we really didn't think overall there was an unfavorable 
outcome. So these are the charts. And you know they're a little bit small to read, and I apologize for that, but I can provide these to you separately as well at the end. Uh, the first two on the top are the change in net position at the government-wide level to the beginning net position, and then the change in fund balance at the fund level to the beginning fund balance. So this is kind of just the percent change from prior year to current year. And again, that's a trend over five fiscal years. So you can see the big dip from 2016 to 2017, and then it pretty much levels out from 2017 through 2020. Uh, the bottom left graph there talks about the unassigned and assigned fund balance to your total expenditures. And a real big key uh, for governmental entities is what is our unassigned fund balance at the year end as a relationship to those expenditures. And you can see there you're up over 30%, which is very good. I think anything above 20% is very good, uh, but the chart, with that dip from 2016 is showing, okay, well, it went down for that year and then it's kind of leveled out. So I think, you know, they consider it to be quote unquote unfavorable, but when we evaluate that, you know, we're not that concerned because we know that you're well up over 30%, which is a very good ratio to have um, as a governmental entity. But these are the last four that I've presented here. Uh, again, cash and investments on hand to your total expenditures. So, you know, the big revenue coming in for the district comes from November, December, and January with those property tax assessments, those property assessments coming in. Um, so what is our cash on hand at year end and is it able to meet the needs of our expenditures until we get that major source of revenue that we have? Uh, again, that's a pretty strong, it, it's declined, but it's still a pretty strong ratio. You're up over 40% um, when you talk about your cash on hand to your annual expenditures. So I think that's a, a pretty good ratio to have. Um, so I did just want to go through those again here at the end, you know, we go through what they ask us to do, you know, and those procedures aren't anything that's based on judgment at all. We just, they provide us with, Hey, here's how you do it. We go ahead and perform those. And then afterwards we take a step back and say, all right, well, based on all the information that we have, do we think that there's an issue here or not? And again, we decided that there's not, but we just kind of wanted to bring it to your attention. Uh, and some of the factors why we said, said there wasn't. Uh, first and foremost, like I mentioned earlier, you know, your unassigned fund balance at 37% is very strong for you to have. Cash on hand at 44% is very strong as well. We did note that there was an increase in the assessment rate for fiscal 21. Um, so that's certainly going to bring in more revenue for you uh, and help that fund balance trend upward likely uh, going forward. And then, you know, based on their procedures, that 2016 to 2017 decline was a major factor in how they ask us to evaluate it. But we know that it's really steadied out since 2017, uh, which is very good. That drop is gonna roll off next year. So when I'm here next year, we probably won't have that same result when we go through their procedures. So that's all that I had again. We certainly appreciate the opportunity to serve as your auditors. And I'm just kinda gonna step back over here uh, so I'm not standing in front of everybody, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Any questions? Lord? Can we get the lights back on so I can see my questions? But one of the questions we had in the last uh, uh, budget discussion was about handling the committed, uncommitted, the money we've set aside for the uh, upcoming seawall repair. Currently, we have not assigned or committed that, even though we talk about having the intent that part of that cash. If we identified that as either assigned or committed, these I'm assuming these ratios would change. Is that correct? Let me just make, okay, this, this one works. All right. Uh, the one that would change is that unassigned or assigned fund balance to the total expenditures. Right, so, so when you were saying 30% or whatever higher it was, if we took $300,000 out of that, that might be a significant change in that presentation of that ratio. That's certainly something that I would be considering whenever you, you discuss how much you wanna set aside uh, to commit or assign the fund balance. Now, I'll tell you, with, with the way the standards pronounce when it talks about these different layers of you know, restricted fund balance, committed fund balance, assigned fund balance, uh, I'll just go through it pretty quickly, kind of what they all represent. A restricted fund balance would be something where an outside party has said, you know, we're giving you this grant revenue or we're giving you this loan 
and you're only allowed to use that on certain purposes. So an outside party is restricting how you can utilize those funds. When it talks about committed and assigned fund balance, those are, I don't wanna say restrictions, but those are uh, things that you're putting on place of fund balance that you have internally. Committed is at the highest level of decision-making authority, which would be the board. So if you guys decided we're gonna take a portion of this fund balance and commit it to be used on that seawall project, you would go through a formal process where you know, you're voting and approving that to happen at this level. Um, you certainly have the ability to take that commitment away. You just have to go through the same process that you, you went through to commit it to uncommit it. So you would go through the vote or the, the ordinance or the resolution, or however you chose to do that. Assigning fund balance is the same process, um, but what you're able to do is you guys could designate someone to say, okay, we're gonna designate this person to be able to assign fund balance and they can kind of quote unquote commit it, um, but it's not at the highest decision-making authority of the district. Now, what your cur current policy is, is it states that the board is the only entity that has, or you know, person or group that has the ability to assign fund balance. So for you guys, assigning it and committing it is really going through the same process. Um, and then unrestricted is obviously you're able to utilize those funds in any manner that, that you choose. So certainly to answer your question, you know, when you're talking about setting aside some of that funding that, that you've been discussing over the last several years now, uh, committing it or assigning it uh, is something that you guys would be able to do, but I would certainly keep in mind, where does that leave us with our unrestricted fund balance? And are we still gonna be able to um, function the way that we need to function with that being committed. And again, you know, a commitment's not a, a finalized thing. You can always go through the process of uncommitting it. If six months down the road, you say, you know what, let's pull some of those funds back out that we committed uh, and use as unassigned. And along that line, uh, our budget discussions clearly talk about setting money aside mm -hmm. for uh, the seawall. And previously there was a, a dredging of the marina was another, and I think that's 2016 fund balance number is high because there was a, a huge amount of money that was accumulated to pay for the seawall or the marina dredging. And if it had been committed and didn't show in that, you might not see that, that big drop. Um, but we've clearly said that we're setting aside money for our future seawall uh, repair, but our financial statements don't demonstrate that. So, my take on it is that we're effectively overstating the amount of fund balance and actually cash that's available for operating expenses. <clears throat> Understanding that we can still uncommit or unassign revenue. But some people in my past experience complain that we've accumulated, the, the governments that I previously worked for have accumulated too much fund balance, too much cash. And 30% going down to maybe 15% would be a significant change in the impression that a reader of the financial statements might have on how much we're doing and whether we have sufficient as opposed to an excess might be the, the question. Right. And, you know, when it talks about how things are presented in the financial statements, um, versus, you know, we've just talked about having this or we, we're putting this in our budget, it's really, you know, you have the ability to tell the story through your financial statements if you choose to. Um, and I would recommend that if you truly have these funds set aside that you're wanting to commit, then you go through the formal process to have them committed to where you can see the full story. And then, you know, if you get to the point where in a given year, you do have a dip because, hey, you know, we knew that we were gonna spend this extra $100,000, for example, on a seawall project, it'll show up in the financial statements and in your story that you're telling. And you can also talk about that in your management's discussion and analysis for the users of the financial statements as they read through it to, to be able to understand why things were the way that they were. Which I think we're doing all along anyway. Yeah. The, well, the other thing doesn't, doing it the one way, even though it's, you, know, you have to do all the voting, the other way if, it's, if a hurricane hit and we needed to repair the building, we could just take the funds instead of using it for the seawall, use it towards, the, you know, redirect that money towards fixing an office, for example. 
Correct. And that's where, you know, in that ratio, it's assi unassigned and assigned fund <laughs> balance, because if you're assigning it, it's a lot easier for you to, to pull it out and just say, okay, we need this money. You know, we don't have to wait till the next board meeting. Um, and that's where, you know, it currently says that, that the board has the ability to assign the fund balance. So maybe you guys could, could talk about, is that the best way to have it? You know, what's the process that we go through for the board to assign fund balance? Is it something that's coming through a formal meeting or are we designating someone within the board to be able to assign that or unassign that if needed? Um, that might be something that you want to consider as well. So to clarify, I thought you said that either assigned or committed would af affect the, the ratios. The committed so would. Know, I'm I, sorry, the committed yeah, so would just not the be committed. Assigned. So we went to the level of committed funds. That's correct. But we've got a couple small amounts that are designated as committed. Correct. That. But if we committed it, it would affect the ratio. If we assign it, it would not. That's right. And I apologize okay. if there was yeah. any confusion there. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Now I need a motion to approve the treasurer's report. I'll make a motion. I'll okay. second it. On discussion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, I don't have any bills from the treasurer to report out this meeting. Um, informational and staff comment, and attorney uh, trustees comments. Start with you, Sandy. Uh, we are going to have the next movie on March the 11th. And it is called Let Him Go. And it's with Kevin Costner. It's a recent one. And some of you weren't able to go to the theater to see it. So we are presenting it here on March the 11th. We are also going to have one on March 25th um, called What Lies Beneath. And that's another thriller. And um, the attendance is coming up for the movie night and I appreciate everybody that's coming. They seem to be having a good time and it's just something that we want to do for the residents so that they might get together at a, a time when they're able to have a good time and get together. And that's all for that. Russell, <clears throat> Russell. Uh, the North side seems to be doing pretty good. I've had to give some, uh, Verbal Education 101 on the deed restrictions, but it isn't all doing good. We're having a problem with people speeding throughout the area in the park. And the Sheriff Department has informed me that if anybody sees any problems with the 10 property back there with people going back there that don't belong there or doing things back there that don't need to be done in that area, please give them a call. And any residents have any problems with uh, Golf carts going out on Florida Boulevard, which are not supposed to be. Please give the sheriff's department a call. They'll they'll come down and instruct the people what the rules are and regulations on that. That's it. Elton. Okay, there's a number of violations that have cropped up recently, and uh, most of them have to do with trailers and boats. Uh, I'd like to point out that the other, the other one is the ARC permit for different projects. And on the ARC permit, well, the, the information in the Tribune says that the office can supply you a, a copy of the form to apply for approval of your project. It's also in our policies and procedures online. I believe it is policy number 33 that you can download and fill out. So you don't have to come into the office to get the form if you don't want to. Um, the question uh, about the enforcement and actions about boats and trailers. A previous discussion, a couple of meetings ago, I believe it was, we had a discussion about the trustees having some leeway to handle these and there was nothing more was specified about how to do that. The question of when, how we proceed, our rules say 
contact them. Our, our procedure says if, if they don't comply, send them a letter. If they don't respond after the letter, we, have, we bring it to the board and ask the board to approve sending it to the attorney. And that's it. That's pretty general. And the whole question about discretion comes up. And I feel that there's there's really no guidance about how we're supposed to act. Then when there's a, a recurrence comes up, the question is whose authority is it to follow up and decide what the follow up is? Is it the public relations trustee or is it the chairman's? The question that the chairman asked me was why I didn't send it to the attorney and treat it as an ongoing uh, violation in the case of 1611 Michigan. The, the interpretation that I applied to the situation was that the previous violations were corrected and therefore we had to start over. I find no guidance in any of our rules and regulations that say anything to the contrary. And I really, really dislike the attitude that I received from the chairman and basically accusing me of not handling it properly and saying that his way is the proper way and I have no discretion. I think the trustees have our, our overall trustee responsibility and then the responsibilities assigned to the different tasks that we were assigned to. Beyond that, there's very little guidance except our own interpretation of how the deed restrictions. Mm -hmm. And I was appalled when I took this office and found out that there was no procedures of implementation or how to do anything in this operation as it related to the public relations trustees or my original assignment of seasonal recreation. It's all transferred in the case of seasonal mm -hmm. recreation. It was by word of mouth from the previous trustee from the public relations. There was no transfer of information. I found files in the desk and that was it. So to be expected to adhere to a specific policy and procedure is unreasonable when there is no specific policy and procedure. I think this whole topic of how we implement rules and regulations is something that deserves a further discussion in a workshop kind of, of setting. Um, The question about what the responsibilities are of other trustees are in areas that are the primary responsibility of uh, a designated trustee is part of that. It could be part of that discussion as well. Uh, we are all under the charter assigned with enforcing the regulations of the deed restrictions, if nothing else. But we act in most ways that is only the responsibility of the public relations trustees. Is that it? Just let me catch my breath. <laughs> I uh, have a violation or potential violation at 6923 West Bayou. A letter was sent to them identifying four potential violations unregistered occupant, under underage occupant, utility trailer on the site, and advertising the property as a multi-unit rental. The utility trailer is no longer there. However, there was no response from the uh, owners of the property regarding the other uh, alleged violations. And I checked with the office on Thursday or Friday and they had not received any information, no updated, no 
new people registered as far as occupants of that. So I'd like to send that uh, violation on to the tr uh, attorney for further action. Any objections? None. No. Go ahead. Okay. Um, a letter was sent to the owner at 6917 East Bayou regarding a boat stored in the backyard. When I spoke with the owner, he was very irate and uh, accused the board of not doing all kinds of different things, most of them unrelated to having a boat stored in his yard. Um, his period for a notice of compliance will uh, end in a couple days. So I'd like approval to, uh, to send that to the attorney also. Any objections? If he, if he no. doesn't comply. Question, is it a boat or is it a kayak? It's a boat. Okay. okay. Was there one on a kayak? A kayak rack? Not at that property, but that's my next. Okay. okay. There's a kayak rack at, I don't have it written here. I think it's 1918 West Beach, right next to the pavilion. Uh, I talked to someone at that property and they were moving the kayaks inside the garage, or inside the, the property. However, there is a kayak rack there and it has paddle boards on it. So the question is, one of the questions is, do paddle boards fit the definition of, I'm not sure exactly how it's related, but it's, it says boats and similar items, I believe, something like that. So I'd like uh, guidance from the trustees of if paddle boards fit into that same category of not being able to be stored out in the open. Does it float? Yes. Can you put more than one person on it? I'm not one, sure. One or one more. One or more people on it. Yes. So it floats. So it's in essence a boat. I would I would label it that way. I would say the same rules apply. I would tend to agree. I would agree. Any any disagreement? Yeah, it, I wouldn't it, agree with that. It, it's hard to distinguish between <laughs> something a, like that being so such a small object, not a large boat or anything. Yeah. And a lot of people are doing that. You just don't realize it until you start really walking around and looking. Right. They're stored pretty much everywhere. Um, there's a lot of them under the carport, but then if that rack could be moved or a pavilion put over the top of it, then would that solve the problem? I think the deed restrictions say a carport, not under a carport, not under a cover. It's got to be under a permanent structure, is right. what it says. But uh, but if you put it permanent structure, and which you could take care of, it that. would be permanent. And that would that would be, hold true to anything we do. It is hard to enforce these uh, the deed restrictions with the way it says because everybody interprets everything different. So they start getting off on these different ways to to hide things and cover things up, and it's like. You got to make this decision and go by what it says on there. Now, now nothing in the deed restriction says a cargo trailer um, or a storage trailer or a pod or anything like that. So it does say a trailer, though. A yeah. trailer. A trailer, trailer is a trailer, no matter what you do with it. So if the tires are taken off of it and it's parked there, is it a trailer? Yes. It's a trailer without tires. Trailer without tires. It's like the trailer that 1611 has a boat on it. Still a trailer. Okay, what if that trailer is sitting there and the tires taken off it and underpinnings put on it? In a what? Yeah, the underpinning or a cover all the way around it. It's then does it become a structure that's pinned down like a storage building? I don't think so. If you're using 1611 Michigan. No, no. I'm just, I'm no. Just, I'm just, in general, in general. In general. I mean, I see the bill we have for 1611 Michigan and I'd prefer not to spend any more money uh, but it's going to happen. It, yeah, if someone took a trailer and set it there, took the wheels off of it, pinned it down, and put a, a siding around it, is it now a, a storage building? I'm not sure they'd get an art permit for that, and I don't know that the county approves it. So I, I, I'm, I'm unsure on how to answer you yeah. because there's too many unknowns in my head. Yeah. But right. my personal... Common sense says a trailer is a trailer. 
correct? Whether you skirt it or not. Okay. I look at the deed restriction from a very fundamental standpoint. Okay. It says trailer. It doesn't go on to describe anything beyond that. So a trailer is a trailer is a trailer. You fancy it up, do whatever you want with it. It's still a trailer. Take the tires off. It's still a trailer. Put the tires back on. It's still a trailer. Put a building on it. You know, if you can move it, it's a trailer. You know, that's what the deed restriction says. You know, it says a carport. I mean, a carport is a permanent structure. I mean, I don't know of any carports that are not permanent structures. I mean, they're mostly permanent structures. Uh, you know, so from that standpoint, it is what it is. So a, top, a soft top awning that goes over it that's secured down. I would want to check the policy on it because I don't think it says permanent structure. I think it says under cover. So you could have a 10 by 20. Yeah, it does say. Portable under. trailer. Okay. I'm out, sorry, a portable canopy that, yes, you could be. Because that's what someone's brought up to me, the attention of, and uh, and it is a it is a cover. So I kind of wonder if if I know we can't find people for doing stuff, but it is hard to ask people to do things when they see somebody else doing it and getting away with it, and then they come back and reread it and they say, "Well, they did it, but now you're telling me I can't." So a soft covered pavilion or whatever would be it's it's where you get into whether it's a hard car uh, canopy or if it's a soft canopy or if it's a, a carport or if it's a canopy for a car well if we get into the soft cover then a simple tarp over the top of something would be a soft cover and i don't think any of us uh, oh. would like to yeah. see that yeah. no. Uh, being acceptable. I, I would have said, if you'd asked me uh, that the deed restriction said it had to be under a carport. Okay, I, I when, thought, that's what I thought I recalled. Yeah, when, but I haven't read it just in the last The deed restrictions say no boat, boat trailer, travel trailer, motor home, or similar property shall be stored on or about any lot, block, or parcel unless in an enclosed structure or completely underneath a carport Enclosed. Enclosed. So it yeah. 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 so temporary. So a carport when you, because the carport's it's not enclosed. enclosed. No, no yeah. it's covered. It's covered. Enclosed, enclosed is all four sides. Right. Are correct. Are right. correct. Right. So it doesn't covered. say covered. Oh, but it no, does say enclosed. carport. It says yeah. enclosed. Enclosed structure or well, also structure. Says, it also yeah. says completely underneath a carport. No. So carport isn't enclosed necessarily but so the and a carport's not always a hard structure right well you can play games with the name with words you know the that's, wording there and that's what's happening enclosed in enclosed or under a carport you mm -hmm. know carports aren't always always enclosed all by all four right. sides right. so you can sit there and, and play games with all those but it's still I'm going to say the public north and south is if you find those kind of discrepancies, it's your responsibility to come back to the board, rewrite that PD of whatever you're finding those descriptions that may be questionable oh, no, this and is bring a, it back to the board and have it voted on. This you is know? a deed restriction. You, we can't change those. Yes, you can. No, 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 you, can, no deed but you can still bring that back. Uh, what I think Dwayne is talking about is uh, establishing some guidance of yeah, how to interpret and apply the deed restriction. And that's what oh, I was partly okay. trying to address yeah. is the deed restrictions are there and everything has to fit under that umbrella. But how we fit it is what needs more attention, in my opinion. And that um, I don't think we got a, a final direction on the thing about the paddle boards or because I think there was some disagreement about whether this would allow paddle boards or not to be in the yard outside of a, a carport or enclosed structure. Denise? I was going to say it says no boat, boat trailer, travel trailer, motorhome or similar property. 
So the whole object is not to have all kinds similar of stuff properties. piled up outside. Mm -hmm. and so right. similar objects. And, and back to the chairman's question about whether it floats and whether somebody could be on it, which is similar to any other kayak, canoe, or any boat. boat. Yeah. So I'd be inclined to say that it uh, it would apply to paddle boards. Yeah, yeah I would. I would agree. And, I would and, agree. And then it goes to the kayak rack. Is the kayak rack available? Uh, okay to have in the yard, even if you can't put kayaks on it. And <laughs> for, other than the fact that, but this is the kind of thing that because we have to deal with. You know, I realize how, I know. <laughs> how how frustrating it is to even have to talk about it, but. <laughs> That is the reality of being public relations trustee. Then people oh, will just yeah. wait 15 <laughs> yes. days. And, and then when somebody uh, does complain, they get attacked by the people that are families of people that are uh, in, the park. Uh, in the park. And that happened to my wife just recently. Well, don't feel like the I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not. And I told her that too. But. Um, I gave you a call about one of your. Yes. And, and that. warned you about that. And that. But anything else? And I, I want to thank Dwayne for taking the brunt of the uh, tirade from one of the uh, owners that I had sent a letter to because they thought he was me. So thank you for impersonating <laughs> me, Dwayne. <laughs> and your text, your phone voice message that I got. Well, I got attacked yeah. in the office, not attacked, but a gentleman came in, resident, and his issue was about the kayak rack. And um, he says, you know, that uh, he feels he has the right to put a kayak rack up. And I told him, well, I get shown the deed restriction. And I says, here's what it says. And he says, well, I'll sue you. And I says, you might guess, I can't stop you from doing that. Mm -hmm. Just understand you're suing yourself in the process. I mean, you're, you're paying for both sides of that equation. Uh, he says, well, I'm rich. And I said, well, that's your prerogative. I mean, if you want to spend your money that way. Um, but he was kind of irate. And I didn't know who was handling it. And I didn't ask him who was handling it because he couldn't describe it. But he thought the person that was handling it was kind of rude. I said, well, I can't address that because I really didn't know who was involved. Uh, but that is, you know, part of the problem with people not reading the deed restriction. I pulled the deed restriction and I says, you know, boat storage, you know, he says, well, it's a kayak. I says, does it float? He says, yes. I said, can you put people in it? He says, yes, I says, it's a boat. You know, describe it any way you want. The pre premise of a boat is, a, is it can float and you can put somebody in it, put it on water, that's a boat. And then how you describe it. Um, he wasn't happy, but he was at least understood where we were coming from on that issue. I would go so far then to say that the kayak rack would require an ARC permit because it's a structure. Uh, I also point that out then that you would have to get their approval. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So I, I will proceed on the basis that uh, uh, paddle boards, I haven't seen any actual surfboards, just paddle boards, but that they would not, they would fall under the same regulations as boats, canoes, and kayaks. Yeah. Yes. Anything okay. else? If I could add something also, sure. yards that are being needing fixing and start needing to be mowed, um, it would be nice if people would register in the office who's mowing their yards. And uh, that way we can actually address the people that are mowing them without spending money to send all these letters to the owners to let them know that we're fixing to have it mowed for them at a higher expense than what they normally get it done for. So if right. there's and that information is on is that on owner's your, information yes, form. So if they'd only fill it out. Wish, wishful thinking. And, it, right. that and, and keep it updated when you change. Mm -hmm. Because I've had a couple where I've called the person who said, I haven't been doing that property for two years. Yeah, already. And that, but I have had good luck with the response from those people that are doing lawns when they've been registered and I've contacted them. I think that's enough for me. Denise. Okay. Um, I um, haven't had much going on. There was one death and I put it up on the board. Other than that, uh, seasonal recreation is, or health and welfare, um, I don't have that much. We do have a, uh, oh, one thing I was wondering was in the Tribune, I had submitted an article for um, a blood 
drive that we're going to have, and it's not in there. I just was curious how that, you know, or anyway, um, that's all I have. The blood, oh, I could tell you, the blood drive is going to be, um, well, maybe I, oh, the 18th of March. From what time to what time? Pardon? From what, what time to what time? One or eight in the morning till uh, one. You have to register in advance? You can, but you don't have to. Walk ins are accepted. You're next. <laughs> I'm that's, to, I'm that's, why you're, that's why you're looking at me. That's okay. Why you're um, I'm accepting reservation requests through April 30th, 2022. Submit your annual requests if you've done in previous years. Be sure to attach your bylaws officers or PP39 if appropriate. Also, if you're using the PP39, make sure you get a new PP39 from the officer website. I received several outdated forms, and this current form must be signed. Therefore, it is not available as a fillable form. And that's all I have for that. Going. <clears throat> okay. Uh, MAS has filled in the 11 test sites from the oil or from the gas bill that we had in 1996. Uh, that project's complete. We're just waiting for a letter to come in from the state of Florida to close out that site as a hazardous materials. Uh, the contract for the buyout of the marine lease from uh, Mr. Plambeck to Innovation Marines was uh, officially uh, signed on February 26th. Uh, I will be working on the amendment to uh, complete that transaction for the new contract until May 21st uh, when the new contract will be, uh, or the old contract will be complete in the new contract will start. Uh, I do want to say to the residents that didn't watch last meeting uh, when Ovations was here, they have agreed in, a, in addition to taking over the marina lease that they do have spaces over there. They will charge the residents the same rate as what we're charging here for our story space out there. It's only outdoor storage. It's for boats and trailers only. So if you need the boat and trailer, uh, Mr. Shannon, who's got his boat out here in the storage lot, who said, just go ahead and arrest me. You can take your boat over there and take care of that issue real quick. The same as 1611 Michigan, if you want, you can store a boat over there if that, had, if that comes about. Uh, shop Hawker on the additional spaces for the 25 spaces that we're looking at in the overflow parking. Uh, they have submitted that or are in the process of submitting that to the county. Um, and I, I don't have any uh, information on when that's going to be returned back to us yet. Uh, maintenance has begun a lot of work on the uh, uh, getting the bids for the uh, projects that we've got coming up. We're in the process now relocating some of the electrical and plumbing down at the pavilion to go ahead and start that paving five additional foot and I do want to thank the beautification committee for popping in a thousand bucks for us to help us on that. Uh, we're also are getting a lot of prices and stuff to start to work in here for the uh, ceiling light fixtures and everything else here in the small hall. Um, we have replaced our 1997 golf uh, club golf cart. Uh, that thing is 24 years old. Uh, it's less than $500, so in accordance with PP15, I'll go ahead and put that out there for the local dispos dis disposition. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, put that up there on channel 732. Uh, and I'll just bring that back. And that's in accordance with uh, the surplus property. That's it? No. Okay. <laughs> I, I want to call myself here for a little okay. bit. Uh, the pool. Uh, over this last week, I've had to go down and talk to some people about having a dog in a pink bag. We, I didn't get the opportunity to meet the people for having a child about this tall in the pool. 
I haven't got to talk to the people that are bringing beers and chips into the jacuzzi or to the spa, mm -hmm. as well as sitting around the tables with their beers and stuff and other types of snacks. Please, the rules are the rules. Just follow the damn things. Um, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said damn. Uh, I'm really getting frustrated that people are just absolutely disregarding the rules, which affects them as well as every other resident. Uh, if it continues, I, I don't know what to do with spring break coming up. I'm to the point of frustration that I'd like to just shut the pool down. Uh, if, if you can't abide by the simple little rules of not bringing a dog, your child, beer of all things, no alcoholic beverages, you call them Dwayne. <laughs> <laughs> so if you wish to have the pool, if you wish, if you wish to have the pool open, please just read the rules as you go in. Uh, the simplest things to follow. And I'm done. With regards to the pool, if you think we need to close it down. Well, back, well, it's getting to the point. I mean, the, the swim club or the exercise club and stuff, they are actually having extra people come in and they've actually asked them to leave to follow the simple little rules there. And it's been abided by. But you just have the residents <laughs> from out of state that are coming down with their grandchildren and everything else and say, no, we're just going to go in the pool and go. Uh, I haven't seen but a couple of occasions where they're starting to exceed uh, the 15 chair limit and the uh, 20 people in the pool. That's been pretty good so far, but don't bring the beer to the kids and the dogs. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of, there's been a lot of new residents in the park over the last two years and they're not getting the post office boxes. And that's a problem when you want to send them something because you got to send it back to their house which may or may not forward the mail down here because they may, don't have a post office box to begin with and they don't take general delivery at this post office. The only place you can have general delivery is downtown. So that's, you know, especially when you want to try to enforce something for public relations, you can't, you got to go visit them personally and hope to God they're home when you visit them. Um, Trustees leaving in the park. If you're going to be gone from the park more than two days, make the office aware of it. Not that we care where you're going, but at least we know you're out of the park. So if something comes up and we need to take care of something, we can handle it in between. Uh, you just give TJ a call or drop her an email or something just to make her aware of where you are and you, that you're gone for a couple of days. Um, public relations. You mentioned the fact that there's no common ground. You've been on the job almost a year and a half. You haven't brought forth other than one proposal on how to improve that job. Now, if you've got some suggestions and you want some discussion on it, put a PP, was it PP38? Yes. The one? Mm -hmm. Phil, want a PP38 for a workshop on what you'd like to see happen. I mean, that's the only way anything's ever going to happen. Yeah, you can bring it up at a board meeting, I mean, at a workshop the day of, but that doesn't give us any time to look at it and it draws some, you know, to bring some helpful suggestions. With regards to 1611, uh, she's playing a game with us. Oh, yeah. I don't care how you want to put it, how you want to describe it, how you want to look at it. What she does is she'll take it out of there, she moved it over to the storage. The storage area she took was another person's storage area. We wrote, the letter, I wrote the letter to the person of that storage area and told them that he was in violation of the storage agreement he had with us, that he had 30 days from the date of the letter to have it moved, or we were going to revoke his storage space and told the boat out of there. That's when the boat was moved back. Okay, but that's a continuation of the same thing. There was no change. She's playing a game with us. She's seen how far she can push the buttons as it relates to how she can get away with something. And this is her, this is her MO. She's done it the whole time she's been here. She did it with yeah. the dog. She's done it with the boat. She's done it with the overhang. Uh, you know, we can keep on playing the game back and forth. And this is the same woman when she ran for office complaining we were spending too much on attorney fees. Right. Okay. The gang of five 
all had that same little message that, you know, we're spending too much money in attorney fees, yet it's, it's one of those members of the five that are raising the issues that are causing us the nightmares. Now, uh, maybe I didn't handle it correctly, but from the perspective of contacting the attorney, you know, you could have said, I'm gonna contact the attorney, see what the attorney advised, okay? And pursue the matter that way. But to, you know, say that this is a new incident, no, it's not, it's a continuation of the previous. And she's gonna keep on playing this game. We're gonna tell her to move it, She'll move it for a couple of days, she'll bring it back. She took the, took the wheels off. She didn't take the wheels off because it needs work on it. She took the wheels off because she was afraid somebody was gonna move it on her. That's why she took the wheels off because anybody that was reading Facebook knew what was going on. I mean, uh, people have come up and told me what's going on in Facebook. And that's what they've told me is that she took the wheels off because she was fearful that we might move it. And we could, you know, a flatbed still would work, somebody suggested. But that's what's going on at that address. Uh, and I don't know how we get her to be in compliance other than taking her to court. The more issues we bring to the court as one entity, that's what I mean. That's why we haven't settled with the other court cases because of this particular issue. There is another issue out there that we're working on. We're trying to resolve it. I can't resolve it at, for the board until she complies with the, this one here. Okay, now we got this issue. I mean, what other issue do you think she's gonna manifest? You know, it took her how many days to get rid of the flag? It was actually, a, a you know, if you don't think she's playing yeah. the game, that's a clear indication from my perspective that she is. Okay, but if you've got some ideas and suggestions on how we can handle things and how we can make things better as it relates to the public relations shop, um, bring them forth, I mean, we may not agree with you. We may compromise on them. We may re-examine them, you know, but you know, to sit there and say, we haven't done anything when you're doing a damn job, isn't my responsibility. I do have a responsibility to the park to make sure the rules and the deed restriction are enforced. That is my obligation. And if you look at my job description, it says the day-to-day -day operations of the park. Okay. With that, let's move on. May I, may I comment on a couple of no. those? Thank you. Um, reports from the standing community. Beautification. Sandy Stevens, 1814 Minnesota Avenue, representing the Beautification Committee. You gotta take a deep breath now. Okay. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, we finished the last minute planning of the, um, <clears throat> the Eagles Virtual Concert, which was held Saturday, February 27th. The two showings attend, uh, attendance for a total of 75. Right? I can break it. There was more at the seven o'clock showing than the nine, which which makes sense because people don't want to stay out late. Um, we may consider <clears throat> for the rest of the season two more virtual concerts on Saturday night, since there's no no dances. And I'll check with Lori if anything anybody else wants to do it. Once we come up with two dates, we'll keep you posted. I want to <clears throat> thank the committee members who attended and helped with this um, program. The people that attended really seemed to enjoy it. They really did. And um, so we may look into it. We're gonna have a, another meeting and we'll talk about it again. Our meeting, <clears throat> at our meeting, we discussed and voted on donating $1,000 to the cement project at, at the pavilion at Sunsun Beach. The, I guess the, the quote came in $1,000 over. So yeah. since we wanted that and brought it to the board, we are more than happy to do that. Thank you. Um, We'll be looking in, at the last meeting, we talked about getting something for the, um, the entrance sign at Bayshore and Canada, the, the brick one. We uh, put those bushes there, but those two sides of the thing look empty. So at the last meeting, uh, with the help of Mark, uh, he suggested another flag on the other side to offset the American flag, and it would be a T and E flag, trailer states flag. 
Uh, we're going to be talking about it, getting some designs, and we'll bring all that out to the board once we have um, it all in one place. And then it, you'll see something maybe next next season for a flag. Do we have a TE flag? Huh? Do we have a TE flag? I don't think so, but we could, we have a couple of great designs coming in. That one's nice right there. Um, so that's like the, I think the T-shirts have that, don't mm -hmm. they? Something like that. Oh, yeah. So two palm trees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll just have a bring it up to you, and you decide what kind of design you guys would like. And I think that would offset that that emptiness on the left side. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Excited to announce that the first our fundraiser for 2022, our first event will be Margaritaville with the Jimmy Buffett Trivia Band on Saturday, January 29th, 2022, featuring the Land Sharks. We have these two Saturdays, thanks to Sandy Simonich. Our second event will be April 19th on a Saturday. We will be, will be the theme will be senior prom. We'll get, get, foot, get foot, footless, I can't say it. Get, get footless and tell your friends to save the day. Um, what was that second date, Sandy? The April 19th. That's 22. Yeah. Okay. Beautification is happy to report that we made approximately $2,000 on the T-shirt sales. Um, and thanks to those who supported us. We have more shirts and sweatshirts to sell next year. It's been a difficult season this season, <clears throat> this season but with our positive attitudes and caring citizens, we have been very blessed as a community. Our next meeting will be March 24th at 1 p.m. in the small hall. Attend if you'd like. Thank you. Well, only, only, only one of you can attend. And that's Sandy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, new business. I can't read the motion. I can I can do her motion. Just give me a second. Let me get to no it. Because I wasn't quite, quite ready for that. All right, um, I make a motion to approve five-year contract renewal with Waste Pro dis discussed on February 1st, 2021 and February 15th, 2021. Mary told me this morning that the attorney looked over the contract. They didn't see any problems with the contract as it's laid out. We're supposed and, to have a second before we discuss Oh, I need a second. I'll second it. Okay. Sorry. Um, like I said, Mary's, you know, said that this has been looked over by our attorney. He sees no problems with the contract um, and that we should move, we could move forward with it uh, as it's been being presented to you today. And you have a copy of the draft. Any questions, Gordon? Um, the last meeting we had a discussion about what constituted solid waste and the household trash being included in solid waste and I thought there was a, a document attached to the agenda that, let me try and find it here, that had language that said general trash and debris was not to be included or was being struck out. That's, that's the next motion. The next this motion. is the motion for Waste Pro. This is just a contract for Waste Pro management. Well, the, this language has, this contract doesn't, it have the, um, Okay, well, I'm looking at this document that was the draft that was on our that's table, sir. That, that's what control. we're talking about? Yes. Okay. Um, so this does not have that language Correct. in it. What's the we're exhibit A? Exhibit A. Yeah, okay, I'm looking at exhibit A. What I'm trying to find it to where it, where it talks about what is being picked up. Because, well, says I'm sorry, the, the first motion there is uh, approved the five year contract, and that's the draft of the contract here that was passed out. Right. Then the next motion coming up is to update PP45, the use of the facility dumpsters. That's the one that's attached to the actual um, 
board meeting and that I have some discussions on. This one's first on the contract of waste pool and what they're gonna do and what we're gonna pay them. Okay, so we're we're looking at a 27.5% increase in the the uh, cost for additional roll-offs above the uh, previous two hundred dollars, but I'm not sure what the increase is for the regular annual fee. Uh, one hundred thirty-five thousand the first year, one hundred forty-one thousand the second year, one hundred forty-seven thousand the third year. 153,000 the fourth year, 159,000 the fifth year. Right, but what are we currently paying them? Yeah, wasn't that discussed at either the first or the 15th, maybe both? Uh, that was all discussed last meeting on the increases in the rate, because she actually broke it out that was an yeah. increase instead of a lump. And she explained yeah. how they wanted to do one lump. Yeah. Every trash, year removal, she... trash removal for the original budget was 126,000. Broken out in 10,500 a month payments over 12 months. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what you're looking at to see that. I don't see it it's, in the agenda. It's in, well, in last. the budget material that Mary gave us the last three meetings mm -hmm. uh, and the revenue and expense budget on December 20th um, gives you the breakout of $10,500 on a monthly basis times 12 months, which would be the $120,000 we're paying or whatever number it was, and then, you know, she gave you, gave us a breakout on a yearly basis uh, as it relates to year to date on annual budget. The annual budget for trust removal, uh, trust trash removal on December, 2020 was 126,000. So that's where that is. So we're looking at a $9,000 increase. Yes. Yes. In the first year. Yes. Okay. So the, the question about what we allow in that dumpster, that doesn't affect this contract? No, no, it has nothing to do with the contract. That's a separate discussion that we're gonna have as it relates to what we want to see in that dumpster, not what they want. We're trying to look at, you know, from two different perspectives. One is strictly a contract issue. The other one is a policy issue. Any other questions? I have the, from the meeting that we had on waste. Yeah. 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 Um, any other questions? No. All those in favor of approving the contract signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, Dwayne, you have the next motion. Read the motion as written, please. Uh, I make a motion as follow to update PP45 use of facilities refuge dumpster policy to clearly define solid waste as discussed at the workshop on February 15th, 2021. Do we have a second? That's okay. Sandy, a second. Dwayne, you get first crack. Okay. Uh, I was wrong at the last board meeting uh, on what could, if garbage, household garbage could go into that dumpster. Uh, I, when I wrote the policy a couple of years ago, I thought I had put that in there, but I was immediately corrected that every dance and Saturday morning coffee breaks and everything else is all that trash and stuff goes immediately into the dumpster. Uh, the only thing I'd like to say here is, is to correct the uh, residents are not allowed to use the dumpster. Uh, am I reading that right? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, 
some reason I thought we said uh, the highlighted R not is was for the uh, household uh, garbage, but they are allowed to throw a uh, their household garbage into that. So you're but I would that? certainly refrain from doing that when you have Tuesdays and Thursday pickups during the summertime, as well as on Thursdays all the way through the season. But you know, if you do have to use it, 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 it it's not a violation. If you use, I, so, I, yeah, I, I, I can't hear you. I can't hear Dwayne very well. Okay. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, <laughs> now we could. I'm gonna take this mask off. If you think you need to in order to speak, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there. Good. Thank you. Yes, that's the question. Uh, well, I don't have a question. I just couldn't hear what you said prior. If you oh. want to say that over again, I'm so, not sure. Are you withdrawing your motion? Uh, no, because I thought. If it's if it's not changing, if we can throw solid waste in there, then no, we, I was, up, it, yeah, it would be easier it, just for me to withdraw that motion. Oh, okay. so you're withdrawing the whole thing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That doesn't need a vote. Nope. The motion maker of the motion withdraws it. Um, clubs and organizations. Don't forget, Daddy, on the Zoom. Dottie, you got anything from clubs and organizations? Yes, I do. Uh, Dottie Deer Wester, 1804 Ohio Avenue, on behalf of the Computer Club of Trailer Estates. Um, we will have our next meeting on uh, Wednesday, March 10th, in the small hall, starting at 10 o'clock uh, for the membership and for training after that at 10.45. That was it. Thank you. Sandy Stevens, 1814 Minnesota Avenue. I just wanted to let everybody know that Bingo's got at 50% capacity. Um, we have been turning people away. So um, my suggestion is to come early and get your seat. We open up at six o'clock. Um, but everybody that had to leave left really no disruption or nothing like that. They understand what the rule is. So just letting the public who's watching know, if you want to come to Bingo, please come early so your seats um, are secured. Thank you. With that, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Denise, do I have a second? Okay. Russ, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 It's 11.05. I call to order in the small hall. Board of Trustees workshop for March 1st at, on 2021. Call to order at 11.05. Uh, any additional items for the agenda? Hearing none. Hearing none, we'll move on. <laughs> Final, <laughs> final review of the budget 2021 and 2022. Mary couldn't be here today, to, but she has not received any additional information from any of you as it relates to the budget. She assumes based on that, that we can move ahead to the March was it 15th meeting or 14th meeting? 15th, 15th meeting uh, uh, with the public hearing and to have the final vote on the budget at that point. Bye with everybody. With that, do I have residents' comments? Uh, nope. I have one vacant thing. Margo, do you have any questions or any things you want to present? The, okay. she's, she's up there. The woman in the upper left hand corner, I don't have your name, so I can't. That's Margo. That's no, that's Margo's in the lower left hand corner, right hand corner. No. Who is it? Who that, that's Margo. Elijah. Elijah? Okay. Do you have any questions? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I'm sorry, we're not supposed to laugh, but it is kind of funny. <laughs> okay, in case she says forget it. Uh, I'm sure she'll call me. Okay. <laughs> Dottie? No, no comments. Seeing none, uh, that's it. All, uh, well, Mr. Well, Chairman, quick, we're, uh, we're going to entertain any questions about the budget. I thought I gave people an opportunity to do that. Yeah. You know, well, I'd like to ask a question. The, we had the question about how we were going to budget for the capital projects that were being carried forward. As part of the budget process, yes, it's going to be moved and, forward. And that has not a been. Separate item. As a, an item on the top coming down, it'll be listed as part of the you know revenue yeah. coming in. It'll be a carryover of our revenue. Okay, but it's that doesn't deducted from the fund balance. Okay, but that doesn't budget the expense side of it. Are we planning to do the seawall repair in the the 21-22 fiscal year? I I'll be honest, I don't know. I'm, I'm not Mary. I didn't ask her that question. Because my understanding is we would need to add that to the budget the expense side. Um the the it, we don't one at person at a time. I'm sorry. Okay. We, we are showing a reduction of fund balance, meaning we're in at least an unofficial way assigning uh, money from the fund balance for these projects. But the, the my understanding of the budget rule under the Florida statutes is that we have to budget the expenses for the the well, capital outlay fiscal. is 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 in there only at the hundred and seven thousand dollar level for those other projects, not these ones that are identified as carry forward projects. Um, in the fiscal budget twenty twenty one, in the in her first draft, she does show the accrual as of nine thirty twenty twenty one for this you know, for the seawall. So she is moving it forward as part of the budget. But it's only as a use of a reservation of fund balance or a commitment of fund balance, not as an authorized expenditure. And that was the point I was we trying to make. We did authorize it. No, no. We have to authorize it going along. The, the authorizations expire every September 30th. There is no carry forward expenditure authorization. The when Florida, you, Florida you're statute. You can ask her that question at the next meeting as it relates to it. And I don't have an answer for you. But okay. I, I don't well, handle well, the budget. If I could just add a couple comments on my understanding of why I'm saying that is the, the Florida statute about budgets says that we have to adopt an annual budget. And that's our expenditure and expense guideline. So I'm taking that to mean that we have to have it in there when we say how much we're going to spend during the year, we have to identify that. And, and I take the second page of this uh, attachment as the quote unquote budget. And that's consistent with what we've produced as a, uh, a budget in the past. That's the number for expenses that the auditors have used from the similar page in prior years as the budget in the budget to actual report in the financial statements. And the notes to the financial statements clearly say that expenditures expire or budget authorization expire at the end of every fiscal year. But she is bringing it forward under determining beginning fund balance. She does bring it forward to 337,500. She shows the adjusted fund balance on October 1st, 2021, the 359,129 thousand mm -hmm. so she's brought it forward she's got the air conditioning shuffleboard court repair and a crude marina seawall repair all listed as part of the fund balance coming forward so we are going to be approving. There, there are subtractions from the fund balance and that's only to identify the fund balance that's available to fund operations and and the budget is the next page where we have a net income identified as 43,000, 
with the ending fund balance of 402,000. I take this that it does not in any way, shape or form authorize expenditures for those three items that are deductions from the fund balance available on the prior page. Well, I see it differently and Mike, I think she is Mike, bringing it forward. Mike? Yes. I think if you read this, this whole thing under GASB 54, committed fund balance means, you know, we, we can we formally, are, it's just what the auditor said. That's what we've done. We've committed that. No, we funds. haven't. Well, and then in assigned fund balance, right on the right no here gordon on on the budget thing that but we haven't taken action we have not committed it we have not assigned it because assigned our financial statements do not show that the auditors did not find evidence that we had assigned it or committed it in any way and shape or form and he also gave us a memo or i saw a memo from him saying that we didn't want to do that because then we're locked into a, a fund where we can't use it as we see fit or need to see. And he refuted that today in his presentation. No. Again, can you, I finish you can argue with Mary on the I'm next meeting when she's here, and I'm sure she'll have an explanation for you. Um, and, you know, that's the best I can offer you at this time. Okay. okay. The other question I have is whether the uh, expenditures of the beautification committee are included in this no. budget. No. Okay, we're including the amount of money that we've got committed to them as part of our available fund balance. We don't commit funds to them. Yes, we, we do. No. Look at, uh, at yeah. the yeah. audit report on page. Uh, just look at which, which book. The, the one the that's second book. the financial statements book, that one. On page 13 in the, uh, the it's a report called balance sheet general fund. Under the fund balance section, there's $11,082 committed. What are you on? Page 13 in, the, in this book, oh, the, the audit okay. book. Okay. There's 11,000 that was committed to beautification as of uh, September 30th, 2020. So I'm assuming that based on the reports that we received from the beautification that they still have a funds available. They run, their, they run their funds through us. They don't right. have a separate checking account. Right, but if you look at the $644,000 fund balance, that's the starting point for this budget worksheet that's saying that that $644,000 is available for the board to use. Yeah, correct. And if we're saying the beautification money is not included in this, I on the expense it, side, it we should not include it on the revenue side or fund balance side. Again, you can ask Mary at the next board meeting that question because I don't have an answer for you as it relates to it. Yeah. All right, do I have a motion to adjourn? I make motion. the motion. <laughs> second. I'll second it. <laughs> All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 aye.